Diego, one. Giuseppe couldn't shake the feeling that someone besides the kids was in his home. After a late night performance, he had gotten home later than was expected, sent the babysitter on her way, then fell asleep on the living room couch while watching a movie. It was now just after midnight and after turning the TV off, the house was eerily quiet. It wasn't the peaceful kind of quiet where the crickets were singing in their low tunes. The AC was humming throughout the house and nothing was going on for blocks. He'd left the AC off and the crickets' music was nowhere to be heard. And crickets only stopped singing when a threat was present. Giuseppe decided to check on his children, Bethany, Carlo, and Diego. His ten-year-old daughter Bethany was a light sleeper and would wake up if a thumbtack hit the ground from across the street. Carlo, the middle child, could sleep through anything while Diego was somewhere in between. Although Diego had been quite restless since Giuseppe and Diego's mother Jade had split up three months prior. If Bethany was still asleep, however, Giuseppe couldn't imagine there was any validity to his paranoia. He quietly moved past the back doors leading to the yard and pool. They were made of glass, so the beautifully lit pool littered with floaties and boogie boards revealed itself to him amidst the dark, haunting night. He moved past a framed picture of his first serious performance. A 24-year-old Giuseppe was at the head of the stage screaming into the microphone in hand with an audience of hundreds cheering. When Giuseppe walked into the next room, the dining room, he realized it was colder than the rest of the house which was odd due to the AC being off. And even then, the AC was not connected to this room, which usually meant it was one of the hotter rooms in the large house. He felt a breeze flow past him. His eyes shot to the sliding glass door that also led to the backyard though was further from the pool's light and therefore darker. The sliding glass door was slightly ajar, just open by a few inches. He remembered locking that hours ago. The slightest echo of metal jingling in place emanated from the upstairs hallway. Only Diego's bedroom doorknob jingled like that. Giuseppe completely lost it. He broke into a run towards the stairs. Whoever is in my house, I'm gonna fucking kill you if you don't leave. Once he made it to the second floor, he barreled towards Diego's room at the end of the hall. Diego's door was open. Giuseppe moved into his son's bedroom, fists clenched so tightly he could turn coal into a diamond. Giuseppe wasn't sure if it was from the adrenaline or from his panicked psyche, but everything in the room was completely still. From the picture of Diego with his t-ball team to the box of toys in the far corner, it was as if the room was frozen. Diego was still in his bed and like a tree with outstretched limbs, he saw the thin figure that stood over his son. Diego stared at the woman, surprised but not frightened. She held a small steak knife in her left hand. It looked like a knife from Giuseppe's own cutlery collection downstairs. The figure had her eyes glued on Giuseppe, though the knife was pointed at Diego. He's my son, Giuseppe, you fucking asshole. You can't take him away from me, she yelled. Giuseppe wasn't in the mindset of negotiating. He was in fight or flight mode. Jade! Put the knife down and get the fuck away from Diego, now! He felt the presence of someone behind him and looked back to see Bethany and Carlo shaking at the bedroom's entrance. Their presence only made Giuseppe more tense. He took a step forward, then Jade began to shrink. She looked at Diego, then at the knife. This is what you wanted, isn't it? Fine, then you can have it. She raised the knife, then raked it across both of her own wrists. She screamed and, like lawn sprinklers, Red showered over Diego, bathing the seven-year-old in blood. Two. Diego squeezed his knees together, hoping that would stop him from peeing his pants. It was around 1 a.m. and the police were moving in and out of their house while Diego, Bethany, and Carlo sat in their father's minivan. His dad had so much money that he owned two cars. Giuseppe was standing next to his other car, a sports car in the driveway a few yards away talking to one of the police officers, probably about his mom. After she had hurt herself, she dropped the knife then ran out of the house. After washing Diego thoroughly, Dad had called the police then gathered the three of them together and hugged them so tightly Diego thought his head might pop off. Diego noted he still had a little bit of dried blood on his neck, 
but he left it there because it looked cool. He was like one of those action stars in the movies that Dad always took them to see, covered in blood and always walking away from explosions without looking back. Dad! Diego called out from within the car. He didn't hear him. Dad! Diego, stop bugging Dad. He's trying to talk to the cops about your mom, Bethany hissed. But I really have to go to the bathroom, Diego said. Who's that? Carlo pointed towards the front of the car as a thin man in a light blue sweater approached them. The front passenger window was rolled down a few inches. Hey there, kids, what's going on here? Is your dad all right? The man asked near the window. His voice was deep yet soft. My brother's mom tried to kill herself, Carlo started. She got blood everywhere. Carlo, be quiet, Bethany scolded him. She turned away from the man but kept a lingering eye on him. A large cypress tree positioned next to the car hid the man from their father's view. Diego was sitting in the seats directly behind the driver and passenger seats, while Carlo and Bethany were in the very back seats. I'm sorry, the man said. I'm too curious for my own good. I just know your dad is all and just want to make sure he's all right. Everybody knows my dad. He's famous, Diego retorted. Well, that's true. The man admitted, stroking his thin, scraggly beard. He stopped speaking then. Diego couldn't take it anymore. Bethany, I have to go to the bathroom. I need to tell Dad. Bethany looked to the man outside the car. Can you tell our dad my brother needs to go to the bathroom, since you know him? Bethany said the last words almost as if challenging him. The man began blinking rapidly before collecting himself. Well, I shouldn't. I don't want to interrupt him with the police. But you can use my bathroom if you want, Diego. It's only three houses down. How do you know my name? Diego asked, his insides about to burst. I told you I know your dad very well. The man's gaze was glued to Diego. Okay, yes, I really need to go, Diego said as he pulled the sliding door to the car open. Diego, no, Bethany said meekly as she grabbed Diego's sleeve. Diego ripped his arm away from Bethany, then turned to scream at her. But when he saw her face, his anger turned to curiosity. What he saw in her eyes was something he had never seen on his sister before. Was it fear? Was she scared of this man? I wasn't scared of this guy, Diego told himself. I'm not scared of anyone. Diego jumped out of the vehicle and the man slowly closed the sliding car door behind him. He made sure the latch barely made a sound. Diego looked at him perplexed. Let's not be too loud, we don't want to interrupt him, the man said. Diego looked to his dad and almost protested, wanting to tell his father where he was going, but something in the man's eyes made him shy away from saying anything. Come on, Diego, the man said, guiding him down the street. It's only a few houses away. Do... Do you think I should tell my dad we're... Diego started. No, no, no need. We'll have you back in a jiffy, the man said. So tell me what happened to your mom. Is she okay? Do you know her too? Diego asked as they passed the second house. Yes, I know Jada very well too, he said. Her name's not Jada, it's Jade. Diego said annoyed that he said her name wrong. Was he stupid? Oh, uh, I know that, but I call her Jada. It's like a nickname, he said, now stroking his beard once again. Oh, okay, Diego mumbled. He noticed they had moved past the third house. I thought it was this house. I really have to go, mister. It is this house, the man said, swallowing. He looked back towards the police, then down at Diego. He gave him a wide smile. His smile reminded Diego of the way his best friend Chase smiled when he won at Battleship. His victory smile. My front door is busted, the man explained. We'll need to go around the back to get in. Then the man led Diego into the darkness between the two closest homes. Three. Jade wrenched the rags as tight as she could around her wrists. The more pressure, the better. After running out of the house that would soon be hers, she had found a couple of rags near a dumpster, then hid within the darkness behind a neighbor's house down the street. She had rinsed them with a hose before wrapping them around her wounds. It felt much better, but the blood persisted in its efforts to escape her veins. 
Despite the deep cuts, she didn't feel dizzy at all, though she would need to get better treatment sooner than later. Sometimes she was too impulsive, but Giuseppe was a fucking piece of shit. He thought he could just end their marriage. She should have stuck the knife in him instead. She still had the knife. Maybe when the police left, a low, whimpering sound like a baby rat squealing for its mother could be heard close by. She figured it was a child in the adjacent house having a bad dream or something. But when the whimpering came again, Jade felt her heart skip a beat. She worked herself into a sprint, gliding over trash and a downed rake, until she rounded the house and could see what was making the desperate, low sobs. Illuminated by the bright moonlight shining down within the crevice between the two homes, a thin man in a sweater wrenched the shirt off a small boy, partially tearing the shirt with no regard for the boy's arms, which were twisted and manipulated in directions they weren't meant to go. The boy squealed and begged for the man to stop. His pants were soaked at the crotch. It was Diego. Like a cat prowling for its next meal, Jade closed the distance between herself and the pervert, neither he nor Diego seeing her approach. Jade pulled the knife from her belt loop, then buried it in the man's neck. He choked out some guttural noise, then swung his arm around at his attacker, releasing a petrified Diego. Jade easily blocked the man's arm, then ripped the knife from his throat, then jammed the blade into his torso. She threw him to the ground. He was so weak, his flailing arms might as well have been pool noodles. She drove the knife into him over and over, Diego wailing behind her, until the pervert finally went limp. The lights to the adjacent houses bloomed all around them, but Jade was already dragging the corpse away to a quieter area. She ushered Diego to follow her. Grab your shirt, honey, and follow mommy, she said in a sweet voice. Besides his small feet moving, Diego was despondent. Jade dragged the body to a quiet alley hidden by a tall wooden fence. She dropped the body to the ground, then embraced her son. Mommy was never going to hurt you, honey. I was just angry with your dad. And don't worry about this man. He was a bad man who needed to be sent back to hell. She wiped the new blood from Diego's cheek. Mama, what, what was that man going to... Diego couldn't finish his sentence. Bad things, honey. You did good. You were very brave. Jade started. And you need to be brave now and help mommy throw away this bad man. Four. Becky finished chewing the last of the nails on her right hand as she sat alone in her room trying to sleep. She had just broken up with her boyfriend and it had not gone well. Although, with him, nothing went well. Everything was melodramatic and world-ending. He wanted a house servant, not a girlfriend. And after he'd bruised her arm, that had been it for her. Considering his past, the sequence of events in their relationship made sense. She knew there would be a dramatic reaction from him, besides what he'd already said on the phone. She just couldn't figure out what it would be and when. She wished Cindy hadn't left for the weekend. As her thoughts strayed to different scenarios, she found herself drifting to sleep. The screech of the downstairs sliding glass door being delicately shifted open caused Becky to jerk awake. Cindy wouldn't be back until tomorrow night, so it couldn't be her. She was a very prudent roommate who always kept her in the loop regarding when she was coming and going. It had to be her ex. She quietly moved to her connected bathroom, making sure the bed was remade before locking the bathroom door. She set her cell phone to silent. She sat in the darkness, feeling a certain protection by the void that surrounded her. There was no window in this bathroom, so it was pitch black. There was a vent, however, allowing her to hear vivid movement from the second floor hallway. Then the bedroom door creaked open. She jumped in place as her phone buzzed in her hands. On the display was a single word, Diego. A loud thump on the other side of the bathroom door caused the door to protrude inward towards her. She let out a high-pitched shriek. A second thump caused the door to burst open, bashing Becky in the face and knocking her to the floor of the small bathroom. Becky looked up at the towering silhouette standing at the doorway. The man stepped forward. Diego brought the knife upward before pointing it down at her. You think you can just end us, he said in a calm manner while looking at the knife. I thought about sticking this knife in myself before I realized you deserve it more than I do.